Okay, it's good to see everybody in again this afternoon. And for those of you out in television, we just thank you for joining us and studying with us. My, our letters just keep encouraging us more and more that uh, for the first time in people's lives, they're enjoying their Bible, they're studying it, they're reading it. And uh, that, that just thrills us, you know, that we're getting people to finally do what God really expects. Because this book, as I've said a hundred times in this program, was made in such a way that plowboys in England could understand it. And if a plowboy in England in 1500 had enough wherewithal to understand this book, then there is not a person in America that can say, well, I can't understand it. It's just a matter of knowing how to read it and how to separate some of these things. So anyway, we're going to come right back in with our connecting the dots. Isn't that right, Jerry? And uh, we started in Genesis, and it's just sort of a, an overview instead of verse by verse like we've done for the last 12, 14 years. And so we're just doing a fast overview, and uh, we're following the timeline as we come up through the Old Testament. We've now come through the four Gospels and the book of Acts, and we have just come past Saul's conversion which means it's the beginning of Saul's ministry to the Gentiles. And so that's where we're going to pick up now in the book of Acts, if you will join me and uh, come back to, uh, oh, I had it here at one time, I moved it, chapter 13, where Paul and Barnabas have just begun their ministry to the Gentile world, having left Antioch. And they stop on the island of Cyprus and uh, they go to the far western end where the largest city even today was Paphos. All right, so when you get to verse 5 of Acts chapter 13, when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John, John Mark, their minister. And when they had gone through the island unto Paphos, the city at the far western end, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the deputy or the governor of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Now, do you get the picture? Here we have a Gentile that is open to the scriptures, and Paul and Barnabas are attempting to get to him so that they can lay it out in front of him. But this fellow servant, who was a false teaching Jew, a sorcerer, did everything he could to keep Paul and Barnabas from him in order for this deputy or this governor not to hear the word. All right, so now just continue reading with me and see what happens. And so verse 8, Elimus the sorcerer, so, so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, see, held them at bay and wouldn't let them in to see the deputy or the governor. And uh, he withstood them and seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who is now called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is not just a response to an angry Jew against another Jew. This is God's chosen apostle to the Gentile, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, look what he does. He sets his eyes on him, and he says to this false teaching Jew, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease or stop to pervert the right ways of the Lord. And now behold, Paul puts it on him. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. Thou shalt be blind for a season, seeing not the sun. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. All right, now if you'll just turn while we're in this part of Acts, just turn over to chapter 17, and now we get the big picture. See, Elimus the sorcerer was just a symbol or a picture or a type of the nation of Israel in general as a whole. Now, when we were teaching this back here years and years ago, I made the point, I know I did, that God always dealt with Israel back then on two levels, national and individual. And nationally, these things happened, but that still left the individual Jew with the opportunity for gaining salvation, see? So it doesn't that it shut the Jew out completely, but nationally, they were no longer responding as the nation that they were under Moses and so forth. All right, now then, Paul and Barnabas come on to their ministry amongst the Gentiles, and we pick them up again over in chapter 17. 
where they have now begun their second missionary journey. They started up there at Philippi, and they're coming down the Aegean coast in, in Greece. And, uh, oh my goodness. Let's just drop in at verse 5. And I think they're still at Thessalonica. But the Jews who believed not, see, that rejected Paul's message now of grace. The Jews who believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the base of sword, gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. In other words, they were just adamant in their opposition to anything that Paul was trying to do, see? And then verse 8, they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the others, they let them go. All right, now you follow on down. You see that as Paul and uh, Barnabas continue their ministry, it's a constant opposition from the unbelieving Jew. Now, when I say unbelieving, they could not recognize that Jesus was the Christ. They were still orthodox. They were still in their Judaism, but they could not accept that Jesus was the Christ. All right, so here we have the foreview then that this Jew on the island of Cyprus was merely an indication of how God would deal with the nation as a whole later on, see? All right, now then, in order to follow that up, go with me up to Romans now. Chapter 11, and uh, verse 7. And again, it's the same setting. Every place that Paul went, he would always go first to the synagogue of the Jew. And when they would reject him and his message, then he'd go out into the Gentile community and have his converts. But all right, here again, this is what God finally did with the nation. Now remember, I'm emphasizing, individuals can still be saved, but nationally, the majority are rejecting everything. All right, verse 6 of Romans 11. And if it's by grace, then it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it's no more grace. In other words, you can't have both. It's either works or it's grace. Now, under Judaism, of course, it was primarily works. We're going to look at that later. But under grace, it's without works. Now, verse 7. What then? Israel, the nation, has not obtained that which he seeketh for. Well, my goodness, all the way up through the Old Testament, what was being promised to the nation of Israel and what were they looking for? the Messiah and his kingdom. Get rid of all these Gentiles and their oppression. And they could have what we call Shangri-La or whatever, or utopia, if they could just get rid of all these Gentile armies, see? All right, so they had that in their mind that that's what they were looking for, but they didn't want to do it God's way, they wanted to do it their way. And that was their problem. You know, I've shared this, I think, more than once on the program. One of the first times that Iris and I were in the Holy Land, and we were in Jerusalem, and that goes back quite a few years. Might have been the very first time, wasn't it, honey? In 75, 76? And we were coming out of the dining room, one of the hotels in Jerusalem, and uh, a nice, well-dressed gentleman came up to us, and he says, uh, you're Americans, aren't you? Yes. He says, what do you think of our little country? Yeah, it had to be in 75 and 6. I said, it's amazing what God has done. And he bristled. He said, God didn't have a thing to do with it. We did it. <laughs> well, you see, that's their mentality. They don't need God. They can do it on their own. Well, that's exactly what Paul is talking about clear back in his day, see? They couldn't accept the fact that God still wanted to do all these things God's way, but no, they wanted to do it their way. All right, so that which Israel was seeking for, they did not obtain it, but the small percentage of Jews that did become believers are called the remnant, and so the election hath obtained it, and the rest the vast majority were what? Blinded. Blinded. Not physically, but to spiritual things, see? Just exactly like the type was set with Elimus, he was blinded physically, but it was a symbol of Israel's national spiritual blindness. All right, now then, if Israel is going to be blinded, and it's not forever, it's not till the end of time, it's only for a season, see? 
All right, so now if you'll jump ahead with me to Romans chapter 11, verse 25, and we'll be coming back to this same verse a little bit later because you can't help but repeat some of these things. Now you come back to Romans chapter 11, and we'll find that the national blindness is going to end, just like Elimus's would end sometime after Paul put that thing on him. He would receive his sight back before he died. All right, now here in 1125, we have the same kind of a picture nationally. Verse 25, where Paul writes to you and I now as Gentiles primarily, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, and this is why I'm going to be coming back to it. It's one of the mysteries that I'm going to touch on in the next few programs. Lest you should be wise in your own conceit, now here's a mystery that no other portion of Scripture ever explained to the place where people could believe it until we get to this apostle. All right? So lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness, see how plain this is? That blindness, a spiritual blindness, has happened to Israel. But what's the next word? Until. That's a time word. So there is coming a day when Israel's blindness will be removed. All right, and when will it happen? Read on. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles is brought in. Well, what's the fullness of the Gentiles that Paul is talking about? The body of Christ. And so when the body of Christ, the outcalling of Gentiles, that we're going to pursue now in a little bit, the outcalling of Gentiles is complete and we're out of here now what can God do? Open the eyes of Israel and go back and finish his dealings with them. So God's not through with Israel. Their future is still glorious. And uh, I don't care what people say about God being all through with the Jew. He is not. If he were, then all the promises of the Old Testament fall apart. And then that means that ours wouldn't mean anything either. But God will yet come back and fulfill those Old Testament covenant promises with the nation of Israel after the church has become complete. Now that word after just reminded me of another portion that we're going to look at. Come back with me again to Acts chapter 15. And let's just for sake of time, because we've looked at it several times, Acts chapter 15 is a parallel with Galatians chapter 2. It's the Jerusalem Council of A.D. 51 when Paul and Barnabas had to go up from Antioch to Jerusalem to deal with the Jewish church, the believing Jews, but they were not grace believers, they were kingdom believers. And that's why I'm glad I was able to put it on the screen, that it's not just from me, it's from the likes of Lewis Ferry Chafer, and I hope everybody got a chance to read those. But anyway, here we are in the Acts account of that Jerusalem council, and the whole purpose was for Paul and Barnabas to convince James and Peter and John and the rest of the twelve that God was saving Gentiles by faith and faith alone without the ramifications of Judaism. No circumcision, no law-keeping. They've been saved by grace, see? And so this is the big controversy, and finally Paul gets through and more or less wins the day. And now James, who is moderating this particular meeting, comes in then at verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience or listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Now verse 13. And after they had held their peace, everything quiets down. The arguing stops. James, out of the Peter, James and John that we're dealing with in especially Galatians chapter 2. And so James answered saying, men and brethren. In other words, he's addressing his... Jewish congregation up there in Jerusalem. Men and brethren, hearken or listen to me. Simeon or Peter has declared, because after all that's what ended the argument when Peter remembered what took place in the house of Cornelius. Peter at the first did visit the Gentiles, now watch the language, to take out of them, who were the them? Gentiles. So you've got to watch your pronouns. God is going to take out of the Gentile world, not everybody, but a small percentage of people for his name. 
Now, of course, no one but Paul ever uses the term the body of Christ, but here it is. Even though Peter, James, and John didn't understand that that's what it would be called, all they realize is that there are going to be Gentiles called out of their paganism or whatever and become part of God's own modus operandi, which when we get to Paul will be called the body of Christ. All right, so at the first, when Peter went to the house of Cornelius, he witnessed that God would save Gentiles on the spot without repentance, without water baptism, without anything else. He saved them by their faith. All right. Now verse 15. James is still speaking. And he says, To this, the calling out of a people for his name, this agree the words of the prophets, for as it is written, after this. See, that's what made me think of it. After this. After what? After God has called out a people for his name. See how it all fits? When the fullness of the Gentiles be brought in? Well, when is that? After this. <laughs> you following me? Good. So after this, the prophet says, I will return. And of course, he's merely the spokesman for God himself. And so God says, I will return and build again the tabernacle. And the other word for tabernacle was temple, remember. And he'll rebuild again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down and has been now for almost 2,000 years. See? And I will build again the ruins thereof. Now, what does that mean? God is still going to finish his Old Testament promises with the nation of Israel. Now, let's go back and look at it. It's in the book of Amos. And uh, you got to read it with your own eyes. And you come back out of the uh, major prophets, Hosea, or Daniel, Hosea, Joel, and then Amos. And come to the last chapter, Amos chapter 9. Amos chapter 9. Because this is the very verse that James was prompted to quote. Now here in Amos chapter 9, just like all the prophets of Israel, the major as well as the minor, were always talking about the bad things that would happen to Israel, their chastisement, but the end result would be God's blessing. Well, first was the Babylonian, remember? Then came the Roman invasion of 70 AD. Now the one that's left is the tribulation and the second coming. All right, so now Amos has brought all three of these around, and you can just jump in at... Uh, Oh, verse 8, so you get the flow, as I call it. Amos chapter 9, verse 8, Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom. I will destroy it. See what I talked about? The bad things happen before the good things. And I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob. See, he's not going to totally annihilate them. There's going to be a nation of Israel left for end time. Verse 9, for lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations. That's why they've been out in dispersion. Like as corn or grain is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, who say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. In other words, they rebel against all of God's overtures. But now verse 11, see, after all the chastisements, after the horrors of the tribulation are past, now here comes the promise, and this is what James quoted. In that day, when God is ready to come back and finish his work with Israel, in that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, and they shall possess, and so on and so forth. And then you come down to the verses at the end of the chapter. We might as well read them, because this is Israel's future. Don't you ever let somebody tell you that God is through with Israel. No, he is not. Their blessings are coming, the greatest they've ever had. But it won't be until the church is complete, and we're out of the way, and then after that, Yes, here it comes. Now, let's just read them for the thrill of it. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper. The treader of grapes will overtake him that soweth the seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. That is, with blessings, see? And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities. 
inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit. Do you see what that is? That's just fantastic production. The milk and honey that Israel was promised when they were offered the land of Canaan in the first time. Here it's going to be. It's just going to be glorious, see? And then verse 15, And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I have given them, saith the Lord God. Well, when will it happen? After the church has been completed and taken out of the way. All right, now that brings me back then to what I call the third reason that we can open up the timeline scripturally because... We have to do it scripturally, otherwise we're just, you know, we're pulling it out of the woodwork, as it says. But here we're going to have the third reason. The first one was that Elimus was a type of Israel being spiritual blinded, but receiving her sight at some time in the future. Then the second one was, as we went back into Romans 11, and uh, the church has to be called out and completed, and in that period of time, Israel is under a spiritual blindness. All right, so I want to come back to that one now again for the last few minutes of this half hour to Romans chapter 11 to again show that we have to have a break in the timeline. Okay, we've got it up here, so I better use it. Here we come. We've come all the way out of the Old Testament, up through the prophets, ever since the Babylonian captivity, and then Israel come back into the land, and they were there, and had temple worship and everything going, and the Messiah appeared. He has his three years of earthly ministry, rejected, crucified, buried, risen from the dead, ascended back to glory. Okay, so now then, we've been in this period of time that all the Old Testament prophets... And Jesus spoke of it as being this way. Peter in the 11th thought that they go right on through into the seven years of tribulation and then the second coming and the kingdom. Well, you see, that's where most of replacement theology is even today. They totally ignore this second line. They think everything just keeps on going up here. Well, you know, when uh, years ago we taught those little epistles at the back, Peter, James, John, and Jude. And I know I shocked a lot of people. All those little epistles were written to believing Jews in this point in time, here between the ascension and the tribulation, certainly hadn't started, but they thought it would any time, here they are. And so all those little Jewish epistles were written to believing Jews to prepare them for the horrors of the tribulation, but they can come through on the other side and have the glories of the kingdom. See? So plain. But what nobody understood, and a lot of Christendom today can't understand, yes, God stopped the timeline right there. And now we drop down to this one. And we open up what Paul refers to, and we're going to look at that all afternoon and maybe the next taping. I don't know how long it'll take. But we open up this parenthetical period of time that we call the dispensation of grace, where God is calling out the Gentile body of Christ, and when it's full and out of the way, yes, then he's still going to finish this program, but now it's down here. To me, it's so plain, a five-year-old should understand it, but, you know, most of Christendom can't get it. They just ignore Paul. It's just unbelievable, the mail that we get. I, I had one call. Maybe I referred to it before. I know I did to a couple of my classes. I had a lady in a far part of the country uh, write me, and across the top of her newspaper, she wrote, Now I see what you mean when you say that people hate Paul. Well, there was a letter to the editor in there, and it was the most venomous language you could ever imagine and still be printable all against the Apostle Paul. Some of the language, she said, they kicked him out of Greece, they kicked him out of Turkey, and what an idiot, and see? That's the kind of language they use about the Apostle Paul. Well, if you're going to use that kind of language about Paul, you're not going to be studying him, and so you're going to miss the boat. And that's most of Christendom. They just totally ignore him, or they dislike him. But all right, now if you've got Romans 11:25, I've only got a little over two minutes left. Let's look at it again. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, this secret that was never mooted or hinted at anywhere else in Scripture except what we read in Amos 
But what could you take out of that if you didn't know it after the fact? Nothing. And so same way with some other little statements. It didn't mean a thing until after it was fulfilled, see? All right, so it was a secret kept in the mind of God. And what was the secret? That Israel would go through a time of spiritual blindness, beginning in Paul's day, and it's going to continue right up until the church is gone and the tribulation begins. And then Israel will begin to have an awakening. Now I say begin because it's not going to happen to the whole nation all at once. But you see, as you open up the tribulation, you've got the 144,000. Well, those are just the beginning now then, see? And then the 144,000 circumvent the globe. And then by the time we get to the end, yes, there will be a remnant that will suddenly realize who Jesus Christ really is. All right, so finishing verse 25, now again, that blindness, a spiritual blindness in part, has happened to Israel, see? Specifically the nation of Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. In other words, Israel will not respond in great numbers to the gospel until the church is gone. Now, we always rejoice to everyone that we get, naturally, but we're not going to make a big issue of it that you have to see every Jew saved before anything can happen because God has his own timetable for the nation of Israel. But never lose sight of the fact that he has not walked away from Israel and their promises. They're still going to enjoy it. But until that day comes, he's still working through the body of Christ. He's still out there with the gospel of the grace of God. And it's our responsibility to just simply tell it to whomever we can that Christ died for the sins of the world. He was buried and he arose again. That's the gospel. That's plain and simple. See, now, how in the world can they accuse me of anything so false if that's what I primarily proclaim? That's salvation, see? That's it in a nutshell. And oh my goodness, I wish you could see our letters and re hear our phone call over and over and over. It's the same thing, see? How that God opened my eyes and for the first time, I'm believing the gospel and I know I have salvation. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. 